you welcome to love house media outreach the message you're about to listen to is an inspired teaching from pastor godwin obuche the lead pastor of the living hope international christian center kanu northwest nigeria this message will inspire hope faith and grace in you to succeed in your work with god a series of nuggets for you to excel in your life's endeavor and a package of god's seed for eternity pay close attention and be blessed The great changeover, God's reset button for humanity, is our conversation this morning on this Easter Sunday. We have three key scripture texts I want to read quickly because our discussion is always going to be premised on God's word. I would not want it to seem like I have my own thought processes on the subject of the resurrection. As a matter of fact, this is the most important celebration of a Christian calendar. But beyond the celebration and the excitement, we must begin to leave out the benefits that are inherent in this event of a resurrection. Praise God. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day, he will rise again. Praise God. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Now, in the first day of a week, very early in the morning, there and setting other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb then they went in and did not find the body of jesus christ and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this and behold Two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man, must be delivered to the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned to the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of Jesus, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales. The NIV says it seemed as if they were speaking nonsense. So in actual fact, they didn't even believe that he was going to rise the third day. Right? And their words seemed to them like idle talks and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb. And stooping down, he saw the leaning clothes lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened first corinthians 15 20 to 21 that's the last scripture that we will read as we have a talking point on this subject first corinthians chapter 15 i'm reading verse 20 to 21 just two verses 
But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Verse 21 again. For since by who? By man. Which man? Adam came dead. Then by man, Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. Praise God. When television was first invented and successfully um, demonstrated in San Francisco in USA in 1927, September 7, by a man called Philotelo Fanswart. He was a 21-year-old inventor who had lived in a home without electricity until he was 14. When he invented television, it was monochrome, what you call black and white. Right? In 1927, September 7. But in 1960, color television was introduced. And many stations around the world and in many countries began to switch from black and white to color television that year. But there were countries which did not switch. They did not bother to switch or they did not even want to be aligned with the new technology. They preferred to be seeing human beings in gray scales, black and white. And it took 20 years before most countries eventually switched in 1980. It was introduced in 1960. The, some countries switched in 1980. Late bloomers. Color television was introduced in Nigeria in 1972, the year I was born. But you see, a lot of households didn't even have color television until many years later. How long have you had something in potential forms and yet do not believe enough to switch to it? That's a food for thought. Still on the sub subject of television and switchover, the second switchover for television was from analog to digital. And that technology was introduced in the 1990s. And that is what enabled us to have high definition pictures on television. And then with this technology, Nigeria, the black, the, the most populous black nation on earth, the biggest economy on the continent, even though not the strongest, we are still struggling with getting switched over from analog to digital television transmission. The federal government has done a lot of campaigns. And these campaigns were words of mouth without corresponding action. Ah, we have set a deadline for 1st of July 2020. We will switch over. Every TV station will switch over to digital. As we speak, there are TV stations that are analog. All right? Check out NTA. It looks like they just rubbed granite oil on the screen. There are some stations on free to L. I they give me eye problem. Switchovers and changeovers are meant to be transitions from what is not desirable, old, to what is in vogue, what is new, and usually better and operating at a higher level. That's what switchovers does. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that was in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Then in verse 31, the Bible said, God saw all he created and he made, and it was very good. God saw what he created and he called it very good. So the earth was actually very good. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 1, there was a disruption in that very good creation. Man went off course from God's program 
and then lost his authority and dominion to the devil the very good earth and everything god had put in place experienced a, sh a switch backward to darkness from light now the devil switched off the earth from heaven's source because of the fall of man and heaven's light supply heaven's anointing supply to the earth heaven's cover of glory over adam and all of all creation and the dominion that was given immediately switched over to the enemy and the earth became covered with darkness because the devil became the god of this world that was a negative switch over it's almost like switching from the national greed and when Nigeria's national grid has collapsed like 115 times in the last nine years, so it's actually a backup. It's not. It's not a grid. So let's imagine that our grid was the perfect grid. No, you never experience power cut, and then you switch from the power grid that is able to power your AC, your gener your your refrigerator, all of your. Uh, high voltage materials you switch from that to a past my neighbor generator and you still have all your gadgets on what will happen you see that the generator crashes or your appliances will get damaged and most of the time when we are switching to generator we put off the acs we put off what the refrigerators we put off pressing iron and if your tv is that type that when you switch it on with a small generator, the small generator cries for help before picking up. You also switch it off. So what happened in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 at the fall of Adam was that we were switched. The earth was switched from what? From heaven's power grid to the devil's darkness switch. And so the enemy began to have dominion over the earth. And it was the dominion of darkness. With the devil now in charge of the earth, all human beings after Adam came under the control of that dominion of darkness. The devil controlled the minds of men. And all their thoughts were continually evil. And that's why by Genesis chapter 6, God looked at the creation and he regretted creating man. And then he set in motion the cleansing process that brought about the flood, saving Noah and his crew to restart God's creation process afresh. All of the recorded Bible history, we find God reaching out to isolated men in a bid to prepare for the eventual changeover from darkness to light. So he reached out to Noah. He reached out to Abraham. From Isaac to Joseph. From Moses to Joshua. And to different kings of Israel and the prophets, God prepared for the changeover from darkness to light. Praise God. Now, the, the more God tried to recruit men into his plan for his changeover through his prophets, the more the devil manipulated and made men rebellious. And you find all of that stories in the Old Testament. He will save his people. They will go back to their vomit. He will allow kings to come and invade Israel, take them captives, keep them in Babylon, for instance, for 70 years, brought them back again. And these dark days lasted for about 4,000 years. From the time Adam fell to the time Christ came. 4,000 years. No matter how much time it takes, for darkness to prevail in your life, light will eventually come and dispel darkness. Because darkness is only temporary. Especially for the believer. 
and God's people. I don't know what kind of darkness you are experiencing in your life. But the darkness which made the devil the God of the earth lasted for 4,000 years. How old is your trouble? How old is the challenge that you are facing? Has God made a promise like he made a promise that he will save the world from the enemy? He will save humanity and eventually fulfilled it in Christ Jesus. His word is yea and amen. If he made that promise, he will fulfill it. It took 4,000 years of preparation of prophecies to be fulfilled. At some point between the last book of the Old Testament of Malachi and Matthew, between Malachi and Matthew, there was a 400 years of darkness in the sense that no word was received from God. No prophet. Nothing. And the fact that you experience silence, even though you're a child of God, and you have received a promise from him, and maybe the promise is personal, or it is scriptural, and you are believing God for it. The fact that you hear nothing, you see nothing, you experience nothing, does not mean that God has changed his mind. Because if he waited 4,000 years to send the Messiah, and there was a 400 years of darkness in terms of no word from him to his people Israel, and he eventually came, then your case is not impossible with him. Your case is not impossible. God will fulfill his word, no matter what. If you believe that, say yes. And that's so weak. If you believe that God has not forgotten you, scream yes. yes. That's more like it. And then eventually the Messiah was born. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10 to 16, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about the coming of a Messiah. And he said a virgin will conceive and give birth to a child. And his name will be called Emmanuel. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Praise God. And he will deliver his people from their sins. The prophet gave a vivid prophecy about the birth of a savior to the world. The birth of Christ began the restoration. That restoration agenda of God which resulted in the great changeover from darkness to light. Now, after walking three and a half years on the earth, Jesus was made ready for the sacrifice of his stainless blood because he was not born of a man and he had to take a man born of a woman without sin to rescue man who fell. And that was the principle. And God was not going to change his principle because he was more powerful than the devil. God obeys his own principles. He is a legal God because there is a court in heaven. In order for Jesus to have access to the changeover room where the devil had the keys, he had to die and he had to shed innocent blood Praise God. So that he can get access to the changeover room and turn the world from darkness to light by switching over. That power source that the enemy took 4,000 years earlier. Now, the, the, the Passion Week is a week before the resurrection, the week of the suffering of Christ. That's why we call it the Passion Week. It was filled with a lot of activities, flurry of activities that are highly significant spiritually. One is the Last Supper. You know, It was meant to show that he was offered up for us totally, body and blood. And that's why we celebrate the communion to remember what he had done. The betrayal of Jesus by Judas Iscariot and the denial of Christ by Simon Peter as well as the running away of all the apostles at the garden of Gethsemane where he was to be arrested. And the Bible says that all men forsook him. 
if you are looking at the denial of Judas and the, 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 the betrayal of Judas and the denial of Peter, what about when the arrest took place? Everybody ran. Some ran away naked. Who one died? All the grabados of uh, Peter in cutting the ear of one guy did not stop him from denying his Lord three times. Where was his sword? In that place he was denying. All of this was made to show us that it was only one man that was qualified to redeem man. It was not going to be a group effort. It was not going to be uh, a democratic community uh, communal effort. It was only one man who had that stainless blood who had to shed it. And it had to be seen to be him standing alone. He was the last man standing. The other thing that happened during the Passion Week was the fact that the stripes he received was for our healing. He was giving 39 stripes of a I don't know whether to call it horse whip or iron whip. And the Bible said that his body was messed up beyond recognition. By his stripes we were healed. Medical science have found out 39 specific units of diseases. And so he took 39 stroke. One stroke for each disease. Now the death on the cross was the ultimate thing that happened in that Passion Week. It was the final step of shedding his blood which took him straight to the changeover room where he took the keys back from the enemy and switched humanity back to light from darkness. And the Bible says he led captivity captives and then he gave gifts unto men. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now when he died, three events happened that period. Very significant. And why are these things important to us? It is to show us that the switch over from darkness to light was not a fluke. It was real. First, the cutting in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now, watch this. The cutting was not torn from down up. If it was from down up, it meant that men tore the cotton. It was from up down. So God did that. God tore the cotton. And it is showing that men now have direct access to him. Not through the Old Testament priests. Not through any human person. Who will now say you have to go through me before you get to God? Thank God for pastors. Thank God for the fivefold ministry of prophets, teachers, apostles, and evangelists. But ultimately, every child of God has direct access to Christ. You have direct access to God in the name of Jesus. All right? You don't have to take permission from your pastor to pray. You don't have to take permission from any leader spiritually in order to assert your authority against the enemy. You now have that authority. And that's why I have quarrel with people who think that your pastor is the ultimate in your life. I don't want to get in your business during the week. You can call for my counsel. But with the principle you receive from God's word, by the help of teaching. You can run an effective life and be prosperous and be God's man wherever you are. Suppose you live in a desert like Mali where there is no church in a particular place near Tumbiktu and there is no pastor. Wouldn't you be a Christian? Suppose you are in the Gulf of Guinea lost on an island called Cape Verde or um, Sao Tome and Principe and there is no church there or the church there they speak Portuguese or French what will you do? you won't be a pastor again you won't be a, a, a Christian anymore 
So he tore the curtain from top to bottom. That happened on the day of, of the death on the cross. The second thing that happened was that there was an earthquake. It was a rock splitting earthquake. The Bible says that rock even split into two. And we, you find that in Matthew chapter 27 verse 51. It meant that his death was so powerful an earth shaking event that had repercussions on creation. That the man who created us has died. So there was a tremor. There was a shaking. And that's why there was darkness between 12 to 3. Because he was carrying the weight of the world upon him, the sins of the world. And God literally turned his face away from the earth. And there was darkness for three hours. It was massive. The third event that happened that day was that the tremor, the earthquake, caused tombs of saints that had died to be opened. And after the resurrection, those guys came out of their tombs because Christ was the first fruit. They followed. They came out of their tomb and they were seen by many people in Jerusalem. So they saw them. Imagine a relative who had died. There was a very devout believer in God. And he died 10 years earlier. You buried him somewhere in Jerusalem. You had forgotten about him. And then on the morning of the resurrection, as there was information flying that the body of Jesus had been stolen, instead of being told the truth, there were more than 500 people who saw Jesus after he resurrected. And so there was proof. So the resurrection is not a lie. With that, the changeover was complete. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ completed the power shift. Power switchover. From Satan to Christ as the new Adam and the last Adam. So authority and dominion came back to where it was originally lost. Jesus was done with the assignment. And on the day of Pentecost, as he had told his disciples that they should stay in Jerusalem and not go out, and the Holy Ghost came, and that was the birth of a church, the embassy of God on the earth, the authority Adam lost, which Christ retrieved, was officially handed over to the church. And you were in that church. So, it can continue to transmit, the church can continue to transmit this authority from people to people through the work of evangelism, through the work of ministry. And this transmission of power happened over 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem with a band of 120 disciples gathered in the upper room. And when Peter preached that famous sermon, 3,000 people were added to the church. So on the first day of the church, they had an attendance of 3,120 people. Today, today, the church is over 2 billion people. If it was a fluke, it would have died. The church has endured all kinds of persecution. We serve a living God. He is alive. He is not dead. You can visit the grave of other religious prophets. If it is possible, you can visit the grave of Prophet Muhammad. You can visit the grave of who? Buddha. But if you visit the grave of Jesus, he's empty. Because he arose. An empty tomb is what you will find. What are the benefits of a switchover? So I can wrap up my thoughts. The benefits of a switchover. Because if we hear these fantastic stories, and it, it looks like fairy tale, and then there is no application, how does that benefit me? There is no benefit you can take from it. Then why are we telling the story? Just like tales by moonlight. When we're growing up in the villages and in towns where Tales were told. They told us those tales as part of the evening entertainment. 
I read a book when I was growing up, African Night Entertainment. How many of you read that book? Oh, literature. Okay. So, they told us stories. How even tortoise played drums. The tortoise that we used to see, is, how does he play drums? And they also told us how tortoise got its uh, cracked shell. But it fell from heaven. And as it landed, the thing scattered. Those stories had no life applications. They were meant for entertainment. But this resurrection story and the stories of the scriptures, they are real. And when we believe them, we see the specific real ramifications in our lives. The benefits of a switchover. Number one benefit of a switchover, which is the resurrection, is the word of God. In John 1, 1, the Bible says that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The one I want us to read from the screen is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, concerning the word of God. The major benefit, a major benefit of the switch over. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. All right, for the word of God is living and active, just like Christ is living and active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. And it judges the thoughts and attitudes of a heart. The word of God gives us wisdom and sound counsel. It builds our faith in God. And helps us to live righteous and sanctified lives before God. So we must meditate on it day and night. According to Joshua 1 verse 8. That this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. With a view to observe to do what is written therein. It is in doing that that you have good success. The word of God gives us the keys to the kingdom. And it enables us to live as believers and fulfill our purposes individually on the earth. Without the word of God, your life and my life is of no effect. And the word is made alive because of a resurrection. Praise God. The power of Jesus is the other changeover benefit. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, and you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses for me. Where? In Jerusalem. In Judea. In Samaria. And unto the uttermost part of the earth. I will read from here. Matthew 10 verse 8. Concerning the power of Jesus. And it became possible. For us to access. Because of the resurrection. Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 says, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. By the resurrection you will have power of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. The Holy Spirit helps us to develop a Christ-like character through the fruit of the Spirit. For February and March, every Wednesday, we study one ingredient of the fruit of the Spirit in this place. From love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and all of that. That's the power that we get from the Holy Spirit. To be able to love without condition. To have joy in spite of the situation we're facing. To have peace irrespective of the turmoil around us. We can heal the sick. Raise the dead, cast out devils through the power of the Holy Spirit operating in us. And then, the last but not the least of the power that we have by the help of the Holy Spirit, which is the power of Jesus, is that he gives us gifts that helps us to be effective ministers of the gospel. Especially speaking in tongues, discernment. Somebody is telling you something, you know what he's saying is not true. Or you need to travel. But the Spirit of God is telling you, apply the brakes. You can't go now. 
healing and miracles. These are enabled by the power of Jesus through the power of the Holy Ghost. And it is the result of a resurrection. If Jesus never resurrected, the Holy Spirit would not have come and we would not have been effective ministers and dispensers of the gospel. Remember, the, the disciples were huddled up in the upper room. 120 of them had no power. They were afraid until the Holy Ghost came. The third is the name of Jesus. The benefit of the resurrection. The benefit of the changeover. Philippians 2 verse 10 to 11. The name of Jesus comes with power and authority. As believers, we must use that name. There is power in the name of Jesus. For in everything we say and do, it's all done in the name of Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. The name of Jesus has the capacity to stop everything evil from happening. Whether they are in heaven, on earth, or on the earth. And when we say heaven here, we're talking about the third heaven, the skies, where the enemy operates as a prince of the power of the air. So that if a witch is flying at the name of Jesus, we'll bring him down. The airspace over our homes, we control it by the name of Jesus. And he says every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of the Father. To the glory of God the Father. So in the name of Jesus, we approach God the Father. He said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. We receive salvation in whose name? In the name of Jesus. We cast out devils in the name of Jesus. We heal men and women. Healings take place in the name of Jesus. And the devils are powerless in the name of Jesus. I don't know if you have experienced it. It may sound a bit sublime that you were in a dream and somebody wanted to kill you. And you open your mouth in the dream and you say in the name of Jesus and that person disappeared. How many of you have experienced that? Or you saw yourself trying to have an accident in the dream. And then you say in the name of Jesus. That's dream. Brother Demola and I were driving from Abuja to Kano some years ago on the election eve of Yaradua. We were approaching Zaria and we were doing 120. And I was very testy. And we were approaching that sharp bend before you approach Zaria. Where there are rocks on the right. Okay? And so I, I wanted to open the pigeon hole to ask Zemola to carry money from there so that we'll buy some drinks as we enter Zaria. We never reach Zaria now. What's the hurry? We still had about 10, 15 kilometers. I was doing grabados, staring with one, doing 120, giving instruction. James Bond. There was a jeep in front of us. He entered a pothole that we should have dodged. That guy with his shocks and the big car escaped it. We entered. It's Jesus that was carrying us. We were in the air. I literally saw my life leaving me. You see, you know how an entire car will be resting on only one tire? That's, that's how we're going. That time they were constructing that part of a road and there was a gully between the main road and the bush. How we flew over the gully and we didn't crash into that place is still a shock to me. But all I knew I kept saying was Jesus. Jesus. Je everything happened in a split of Less than 10 seconds. And the car stopped right in front of that big rock. We would have crashed into the rock. The entire front of the car was damaged. And I was playing his hitting song. And when the car stopped, it was still blasting. So when I opened my eyes from unconsciousness, is the hitting was singing bang bang? I pressed it. I said, Wait first. Tom full and men surrounded us. The mother was holding. 
when we left Kaduna, I told him, put seat belt. He was saying, yeah, big boy, seat belt. <laughs> he was, you know how, how, you know that handle of a car up there? You know, we're supposed to hold it only with one hand. He was <laughs> It was supposed to be a very serious matter, but I was laughing. The Fulani people around there thought we were dead. So when they saw us with our eyes open, they said, Hey! Do you <laughs> The name of Jesus. The name, it has saved me a whole lot. Whether I say it unconsciously, or I say it with my full chest. It is still powerful. Praise God. The blood of Jesus is the other benefit. First John 1 7 and Revelation 12 11. Let's look at that quickly. Are you going to live in the context of a changeover revelation that you have received this morning? In the name of Jesus. Shout, Yes, I will. First John 1 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies. Now, this is, this is massive. He didn't say the blood of Jesus, his son, purified. That would be past tense. He said it purifies. And that's why the Bible says, the same First John, it says, if we say we have no sin, we lie. But if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse us from all, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sins. Look at King James. This same verse. Look at King James. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus is on. Cleanses. Purifies. Cleanses. It's an ongoing process. The blood of Jesus is still active for sins of the past, sins of the present, sins of the future. Let me ask you this. When Jesus died, where were you? You were not even born. Your great grandfather to the tenth generation backward was not born. But he had paid the price for the salvation of man. So when you were born, you were born into Adamic nature. Alright? Until you became conscious and you need you knew you needed Jesus. So what happened? You went for the blood of Jesus. You confessed your sins including the original and the consequential sins that you committed in addition to eight down sins and the blood of jesus did what he cleansed you and he continues to cleanse you you know what happened when you give your life to christ when you gave your life to christ you exchanged your own filthy righteousness with his perfect righteousness all right nothing can be added to that nothing can be taken away from that but as a person walking on the earth you still fall and so when you fall, like you go out, you gather dust, you come back home, you wash. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. May God give us a revelation of the understanding of the blood of Jesus and what it does for us every day in the name of Jesus. Revelation 12 verse 11. Jesus made an atonement for us by his blood. He was our sacrificial lamb. The precious blood of Jesus paid the ultimate price to wash away all our sins. The blood of Jesus is powerful. And they overcame him by the blood of a lamb and by the word of their testimonies. They overcame him how? By the blood of a lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the dead. That's talking about you and I. So the blood cleanses us from sin and it helps us to overcome the enemy. Was it not the blood that the angel of death would see on the lintel of a home of an Israelite? And it will pass. The blood of Jesus will not just only cleanse you. It is a protective covering. It is like the mark on the head of 
Cain. To anybody who touched you because the mark of God is upon you, seven lies for him. If God can mark the head of somebody who killed his brother, you know sometimes I don't even understand God. You killed your brother. And then you are running away. And then your consciousness tells you that if people see you, they will kill you because you are a murderer. Then you now go back to God. The same God who, who warned you not to kill your brother. That sin lies at the door. You went back to you and said, God, I've killed my brother. And people are going to know that I'm a murderer. Give me a mark so that nobody will kill me. <laughs> Wait, if you are God, what will you do? They get out of me. Get out of my sight. But God said, come, 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 come. Let me mark you too. He marked him as anybody who touched you. <laughs> seven lives for them. That's to tell you how much love God has for humanity. Somebody just killed his. You, you gave him a mark to protect him. From what? He should die. See, thank God I am not God. People will just be falling down like flies. Seriously. I'll just create a, an app. I will automate the app. You do something wrong, you fall. And it is special, every, every offense with a special punishment. Like politicians, once you transfer one billion from government account, you rot there. In fact, you will just disappear, you will come down full. You know how Nigerian movies, how ghosts used to appear and disappear? That's how you'll be disappearing. But I'm not God. God is so merciful. So the blood of Jesus is a mark. Finally, intercession of Jesus. That's another very important lesson and benefit of the changeover. Romans 8.34, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5 to 6. Romans 8.34, Jesus is our advocate. You know, in legal terms, an advocate is a lawyer, isn't it? Good. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he is also reason. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who makes intercessions for us? So, wait. Apart from my prayer partner, Jesus is also praying for me. Wow. And if you catch that revelation, you will worry less about things. Jesus is praying for me apart from my own prayer and the prayer of people around me. Why is he praying for me? So that the enemy will not succeed in condemning me. Because he already died for me. Alright? He is my advocate. Verse 35. He is my advocate. Jesus is my legal counsel. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nothing. Verse 36. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. For the sake of who? For the sake of a believer. First Timothy 2, 5 to 6. Jesus is in heaven advocating and interceding for us while the enemy is down here making accusations. So who is bigger? The advocate or the accuser? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom? Now, the era of kidnapping has made us to understand what ransom means. I catch your man. Come and pay ransom and collect him. So Jesus paid a ransom and took you back from the enemy. He paid the ransom. To be testified in due time. For we have a high priest in Jesus. Who can sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? Because he also was tempted as we are. While he was here on earth. You think Jesus never had financial issues? He was confronted to pay tax. And he didn't have money in his pocket. And he asked Peter. What should we do? Shouldn't we give Caesar what belongs to Caesar? 
So what did he do? He said, well, I have dominion. Go and fish. The first fish you catch, the money we need is inside the mouth of a fish. And bring it and solve the problem. God can sort out your issue financially without following the normal protocol. What is fish doing with money? It doesn't make sense. If you are looking for money, shouldn't you go to an ATM or tell somebody to transfer funds to you? Not to go to a pond or a fishery and say, that fish, bring it, we'll see money inside. You decrease. <laughs> fish and money. Wait, even if you put one dollar in the mouth of a fish, ordinarily the fish should swallow it or chew it. And the dollar prints and all the things should be off. Right? You may say, okay, well, it's a coin. But think about it. Coin. And if coin in a fish mouth. Is it healthy? No. It doesn't make sense. Can, can a fish carry coin and still be living normally? Sometimes when you read some things in the Bible, read it again. This thing no makes sense. <laughs> fish and coin. Wait. Do you know that there are things that fish cannot eat? Is it not all of us that are shouting, don't throw plastic in the sea? Because it will kill fishes. Plastic. Then coin. <laughs> coin and plastic, which one is stronger? The fish will die. But the fish was carrying it. And Jesus said, catch that fish that carried the coin. Do you know where the fish carried the coin from? Do you know who puts the coin in the fish mouth? There are some things that cannot be understood through re logical reasoning. And that is why we call it a miracle. And God wants us to live supernaturally. If you wait to get everything you need in your life through process of uh, A, B, C, D, you go die. Oh. Because for me, this is how I live. By the help of God. You start with A. Before you know it, you are in K. On a matter that is supposed to be A, B, C, D. I will just have three process. A, C, F, J, Z. The matter is ended. And we'll start another matter. Why? Because I live by supernatural means. The death of Jesus paid for all our sins. Therefore, we can stand before God blameless. And we can approach Boldly, his throne. You know, there's an exciting thing I will just point out to you and then we'll pray. In the Old Testament, when you go to God and you plead for mercy, people tear their clothes, right? And pour ashes on their bodies. True? They are mourning and they are asking for mercy. They come pleading for mercy. The Bible says in the New Testament with the death of Christ and the resurrection and the power inherent in it, we now come boldly to God's presence to seek for mercy and grace in our time of need. You are coming to ask for mercy and you are coming boldly. Praise God. You didn't get that. We used to ask for mercy crying. Now we are asking for mercy with boldness. What's the difference? The resurrection. Jesus made the great exchange. He took our sins. And then we were giving his righteousness. He took our sins. We are giving his righteousness. The great changeover took place 2,000 years ago plus maybe 2,022 years ago. So that we'll quote it correctly. Like the switch over from black and white television to color television. Many people are still operating in darkness while light is already available. I will be shocked if I go to some cities and still see people using black and white TV. You know the type that we want to see colored. We'll now go and buy a film. All those Lay that film and put it on the screen. So the grayscale will change. 
why are you still operating in analog? In darkness. When light is already available. Plug into the power grid today. Because the price has been paid in full. We believe you have been richly blessed by that message. Should you require further counseling, we are reachable via our social media platforms. On Facebook, we can be found at Living Hope International Christian Center. On Instagram, we are at Living Hope Kano. Our WhatsApp number is 080-9455-7001. And you can call us on 81 56 48 9769. If you are in Kano or visiting, you can worship with us at Hall 3, the Researchers Nursery and Primary School, 122 to 128 Egbe Road, Sabongeri, Kano, Nigeria. Our Sunday service is 9 a.m., while our worship on Wednesday holds at 6 p.m. Remember, you are begotten to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ.